Welcome to Future Focus in March. Um, we're so happy to see you guys here again. Um, if you're new here, I'm just going to explain a little bit about what Future Focus is. Um, so Future Focus is a youth-led monthly webinar series highlighting youth climate activists and their stories from across the state. Each one hour session will focus on a different individual and the intersectional leadership work they are doing in their community and beyond. Um, so to start, I'd also like to thank Maida Audubon, Maine Climate Action Now, Maine Youth for Climate Justice, um, MEAA Changemakers, and Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative for making this all possible. Um, last month, I was the one to give a future focus talk, um, but now here I am facilitating, and I am so excited to hear from my friend and fellow organizer, Jess Cooper. Um, today, she's going to talk about creativity and activism in climate spaces, um, and I think it's going to be a really dope talk. So I'm just going to pass it over to Jess, and yeah, enjoy the talk. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Hi there, everyone. Um, thanks, Josh, for the awesome intro. Um, over the last few years, I have been getting more and more deeply involved in climate action. Um, I've been cultivating a hearty list of org organizations, causes, movements, and activities. Um, and that's all really been over the last uh, five years in total, but two years for climate action. A little bit about where I come from. Uh, I grew up in the foothills of Western Maine on a family farm in Buckfield, which many people haven't heard of. Um, on this first slide that Anya is going to show, there is this beautiful painting of my grandparents' family farm on North Hill, where I grew up, done by an artist, um, Joel Babb from Buckfield. And um, the other picture is of some apple trees in the orchard that I grew up right next to. Um, I have six brothers and sisters, and I shared a room with all three of my sisters at one point for several years, actually. So in a way, I feel that uh, community building began really early for me. My graduating class in high school had 25 people, give or take, and for better or worse, I knew every single one of them. Um, I knew everyone in the school, actually, and also just about every person who lived in the town of Buckfield. Uh, the saying that Maine is one big small town really rings true to my roots. Um, I was your classic teacher's pet and overachiever in high school. I did theater, sports, band, chorus as the class president, National Honor Society. Um, I'm still learning in my 20s how to say no to taking more things on than I can handle because I constantly just want to do it all. Um, someone actually gave me a great quote about learning how to say no so that people can trust my yes. So that's something that I try to hold on to every day. Um, when I was in third grade, I received a flute through our elementary school music program. My dad was my biggest supporter when it came to music, and he highly encouraged my flute, guitar, piano playing, and singing. And I found that early on, music was something that gave me a lifelong community of creative people. After I graduated high school, I set out for college at the University of Southern Maine, and I was met with a flipped reality of what post-secondary education is really like compared to high school. Um, I managed to stay out of trouble for the most part, but I did end up leaving after a year following a nagging feeling that I wasn't really there for anything I felt deeply passionate about. I wasn't creating, except for when I would spend time in Roby Andrews Hall, the artist dorms, singing, playing instruments, taking part in a community creative flow that it seemed to happen spontaneously and sometimes without any sort of invitation or even a conversation about it, it just happened. And I've always managed to keep myself surrounded with people who are creating and kind of tapped into this flow. Um, in 2015, I had my daughter, Adelaide. Uh, by far, creating a whole new human being has been my most creative work. Um, these are some pictures of me and Addie. Um, two years after having her, I moved to a farm near where I grew up, and I lived with a musician and dancer couple and their kids and farm dogs. And um, surprise, I actually joined a dance circus, for real, and a band. <laughs> Once again, I was completely surrounded by people who were focusing on creating, and the three of us living on the farm founded a creative nonprofit 
with the mission to turn our unique studio space that we had into a safe space for artists and creators of all kinds who, um, it was targeted mostly to typically marginalized and overlooked people in the art world in our very rural and white area. Um, creating that was uh, a pretty, it was a pretty easy endeavor. I feel like everything really fell into place for that. And it kept me, um, it kind of introduced me to the community here in Norway. We actually took over organizing the Norway Music and Arts Festival where you can see the poster here. My friend Carly Woods, who works in MCAN with us, actually designed that poster and won a contest for it. Um, yeah, working with Creative Norway and doing that was really what launched me into the community here in Norway. Um, in 2019, Scott Vlaan from the Center for Ecology Based Economy here on Main Street in Norway introduced himself to me at the local food co op. Um, he had recognized that I danced with the circus the previous summer and started talking to me and must have seen that I was somebody who might be interested in climate action. Um, and he asked us if we would come and dance at a day of action in Augusta. Um, unfortunately, no one from our dance company could make it there on a Tuesday, but I remembered that interaction with him and I remembered looking up the day of action. And, and that was the first time that I really looked up what CV was and what they were all about. Um, later that summer, we were asked by them again to perform three dances at the global climate strike in Norway. And that is where my climate story really began. Um, at this global climate strike, I was given the opportunity to sing, dance, and speak about being a young mother and why the environment around me truly mattered. And up until then, I hadn't really put thoughts on a piece of paper, much less spoken them in front of a hundred people. Um, being asked to write, sing, dance, and think creatively about why I was at that strike was what opened my eyes to climate action and why creativity is such an important component of what I do as a climate organizer. Uh, I feel really strongly that art, dance, and music are something that we all share. We all enjoy these things, whichever, whichever parts of them we enjoy, it's all different for all of us. And we're all captiv captivated by them in our own ways. Um, the, our websites that we create, infographics, flyers, signs, and efforts for climate activism would be really difficult to catch people's attention without a creative individual or multiple creatives behind them. We need catchy tunes on the radio that talk about changing our actions and fighting for our future. We really need books and movies and poems and billboards and posters and shirts and banners about climate action to get people to, to see what we're doing and to see why it matters and to, to appeal to their emotions about it. Um, famous creators have this access to unlimited platforms of sharing to massive numbers of people. And many of them don't always use that power and opportunity responsibly. Um, but I feel that young people have been capitalizing on this realization. Through social media and many other creative means, young people have tapped into their creative selves and have been organizing and advocating for their futures all over the world in so many different creative ways. Because we know we have to get creative and especially when coming up with climate solutions. We see adults doing the same things, things that just aren't working and in many cases are making things worse. So I think that's really where a lot of the creativity can come in and add new energy into these, into these issues. Um, so the, the pictures that are here for the learning and connections, connections lab that I have, after the global climate strike, I got an amazing opportunity to go to the MEEA Changemakers Gathering. And it really confirmed that I was around the right people, on the right path, doing what I really wanted to be doing, and that was climate organizing and learning about just the main climate organizing scene. Um, this picture, the first picture on the left there is of Vic Barrett, who was an incredible keynote speaker um, over that weekend. I had never heard of Vic Barrett and they really just touched me in a way. I just couldn't believe somebody so young was speaking with so much fluency and 
just it was so powerful and that really just like settled it for me that I wanted to learn about these things and I wanted to be around these creative people and I wanted to keep doing this. Um, this other picture over here was this awesome gathering we all had at the end of the the Changemakers weekend and it just shows like all the amazing people that I was able to meet. Um, and actually is a picture of one of my good friends who I work with now that moved to Norway. So meeting creative people has really been just such a wonderful thing as I've learned to become a climate organizer. Um, another aspect of creativity that comes up for me when I think about climate organizing is that burnout comes really fast. Uh, for me, creativity reignites that flame of climate action that I feel called towards, and it keeps my work joyful amidst the heaviness that can come with it. When I experience burnout from climate organizing, the first thing I seek out is creating. I dance, I make music, I make art. I usually go to the dance studio and I turn on the music as loud as I can and I move my body. And it reminds me where my roots are and where my climate action journey began. Creativity is finding inspiration. Uh, I took my experience in the creative community and it led me over and over to other people in my community who were using creative solutions to all kinds of issues, including climate advocacy and action. Um, for me, Spoke Folks has been my my baby in, in creativity and climate action. Um, I was approached around the same time, the same winter that I did the global climate strike, I was approached about this idea to have a bike hauling service. And it, it really wasn't even a full idea yet. Um, it was kind of based off from this bike hauling trash company in Northampton, Mass called Pedal People. And so I started gathering with a group of people, really creative, really awesome people in Norway. And spoke folks and climate organizing were the reasons that I actually moved to Norway and fully started this business. Um, so last spring when the pandemic began, began, we had really started like trying to figure out what we wanted to do with this idea. And initially spoke folks uh, was supposed to be this trash, trash recycling, compost hauling. And when the pandemic hit last March, we decided to bring food on trailers from our local food pantries to our community. And I feel like that creative, that creative spark between our group of people was what made us say, let's take our original idea and do something different with it that can really help our community. So that was a really amazing experience to be able to be biking food to people when people were afraid to leave their homes and they were afraid to go to the grocery store. And we were able to come up with a creative solution to help our immediate community, which felt amazing. Um, and now we are hauling trash, recycling and compost every week. And it's, it's so much fun. Um, there's, there's so much more I could say about Spoke Folks, but um, yeah. That's my baby. <laughs> um, my other baby obviously is my daughter and creation for me has been very closely connected with parenthood. Um, it requires huge amounts of creativity. Parenting is my number one reason for becoming a climate activist. Um, it requires you to step into a different world filled with play and challenge. It makes you vehemently aware of the climate crisis because of the majority of what you're focused on is giving your child a bright future and everything feels so urgent. Parenting is about teaching your child to make good decisions and to be a good human, to be a steward, a climate activist, and a creative thinker. Um, so in this picture here, last Earth Day, um, I, my daughter and I actually participated in an art build for with 350 Maine um, calling on people to stop investing in fossil fuels. It was a really big campaign. Um, it happened all over for Earth Day asking large finance companies to divest. Um, and in the word fuel, the L, you might be able to see my daughter's teeny little eyes. Um, it was a really fun way to incorporate art and community even through Zoom 
um, to, to send a message about climate action and what we believe in. So I felt like that was a really great example of how that can be incorporated. Um, as defined, creativity is the ability to make or otherwise bring into existence something new, whether it's a new solution to a problem, a new method or device, or a new artistic object or form. Creativity requires passion and connecting with others through many mediums, and so does climate activism. I'm here to urge you to find what makes you feel like your heart is open, like you can create anything and lands you in a network of people looking for new and creative solutions to common issues. And then what, take whatever steps you can to integrate that into climate action and advocacy. Um, my last picture is of our garden from last year. And that's my, my call to all of you is to dig in, to find the things outside, inside, anywhere that make you feel at peace and make you feel creative and gardening is the last thing for me that I feel I wanted to show that really has helped me um, stay creative, stay growing things. And yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful that you're all here today and interested in why creativity is so important for climate activism. Wow. Thank you, Jess. That was uh, really captivating. Your story always inspires me to be more creative with my activism, and I know it does the same with others in our circle. Um, you're really a superstar. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, so now I'm going to invite the audience to leave some questions in the chat and hopefully have a cool conversation with Jess. Um, first, Jess, I want to ask you to kick this off. Um, how do you view your role? being a young mother and only more recently entering the youth climate organizing space uh, compared to most of the youth activists you are interacting with? That's a great question. Um, I do feel like my role coming into the space is slightly different. Um, as a young mother, I feel like more of an adult because of the amount of responsibility I have, but I have to remind myself constantly that I am still a young person and that this is all new to me. Um, I actually have been reflecting on this a lot lately and I feel like my role has been to learn from the people who are much younger than me who have been doing this for, for, for longer than me, honestly, and who have learned so much. Um, I feel like it, it really puts me in a position to act as a bridge between um, the younger people in this space who are still in high school and um, have a totally different experience from me at this point and to help try and lift their voice and amplify their voice um, almost as an adult ally, but as a youth that can come into those spaces and kind of navigate both worlds. I feel like it, it it's a very interesting space to be. And I have learned every single thing that I have learned about climate action from MYCJ and MEEA and all of the young people that I've been in these spaces with. Yeah, um, that perspective is so impactful, especially as um, MYCJ and spaces like youth climate orgs um, diversify their age categories and their racial categories and um, socioeconomic status, um, especially as a young mother. So I just, <laughs> I really admire you, Jess. I really do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my next question is from Caroline Savage in the chat. And she asks about ways a fifth grader could get involved. Wow, ways a fifth grader could get involved. Um, if I had to say creatively, um, I would say get to know your art teachers and your music teachers and your chorus teachers and get to know them really well and, and seek out that adult help from people who are tapped into that creative space and, um, and also reaching out to people from Maine Youth for Climate Justice because we would love to work with young people of all ages with this kind of stuff. Um, 
but I'd say for me, finding those creative people have, they've always been the people who were people who cared about the earth and people who were getting outside. And it was those people who created a safe space for me to, to, to be myself and to explore the things that I loved the most. And that ultimately led to climate advocacy for me. Yeah, that's awesome. So my next question to you, um, and this is so important in the climate justice world, um, especially as a racial justice organizer myself, and uh, how does climate justice and the intersection of racial justice um, come through in your work? It's a really good question. Um, I feel like, through spoke folks that has come come up the most for me um it's come up it's really come up everywhere for me because this is the first time i've been in this work and and really been in touch with people who are doing that kind of work and through spoke folks it's a worker owned cooperative which means that it's it's focused on equity and it's focused on building the community and creating opportunities for all people of all backgrounds, races, everywhere. And so I feel like in working through a worker-owned co-op and learning about values and my community, I've been able to really start to dig into that and find where my passion for sustainability and, and building community intersects with the the low income neighborhoods that really need to have these people interact with them and to to work to work with them and to uplift them and also through creative norway that was one of the first places that i realized what our mission was really about was lifting the voices of those creative people that other people in the town just weren't listening to and weren't considering and weren't creating a safe space for and i think all of that has come into my work in in true climate organizing and um yeah it's it's just so profoundly important and i feel like i am just barely even digging into the amount of work that it takes to to integrate that into all of this for sure for sure that's so important to hear as well um so meredith asks is there a plan for earth day this year statewide and she also added that she has no micro camera and appreciates your vision. Thank you so much, Meredith. Um, from the inklings that I've heard, there's going to be a pretty big social media thing happening um, and or our NYCJ newsletter. Um, Anna Seagal and maybe even Josh could talk more about that because I don't have all the details, but um, I'm not sure what all the other organizations might be doing. I'm sure there is going to be a lot happening. Um, I know for us in Norway, for Spoke Folks, we're planning to actually have people bring bags of trash to our little um, park in the center of town here, and we're going to haul as many bags of trash as we can on a bike to our transfer station and try and really raise some awareness around the local climate orgs in our area and outdoor safely distance as we possibly can. Um, but I'm also curious to see what all of the climate orgs in Maine are going to be doing for Earth Day. Yeah, definitely. We do have a lot of things planned. Um, so watch out for that. <laughs> um, so my next question to you, Jess, is what is it like to be organizing in a more rural or conservative space um, than a population dense area like a city? Um, I, gosh, it's, I think it's a lot harder to, from, from what I have noticed, um, seeing the youth organizers in those population dense areas versus my experience here, I feel like it's a lot, um, less progressive and progressive is not really the word that I want to use, but that's kind of what comes up for me is that it's very conservative here and it's harder to, um, talk to the people, specifically some of the teachers and people in the schools, 
Um, it's harder to get people engaged. I think in a rural area, it's sometimes harder to even get people just to come out and see, see our organization and see what we're doing. Um, I think the global climate strike was one of the first really amazing successful like things that got people out and got people organized and excited and walking down the street and whooping and hollering and yelling. So I think the, the pandemic has added a layer to that of we're so rural, we're so far apart from each other. And, and now we also have this added layer on top. So it is really challenging organizing in a rural space, but I think for me, I've tried to just pace myself and remember that um, the same with the creative flow that I feel that the flow of getting people involved may be slow, but those few people that do get involved are just like so there and so ready. And that's what kind of keeps me going, organizing in a really rural space. So I, and I'm really curious about um, the experience of organizing in a more population dense place because I had really never been able to do it. It sounds really awesome. Wow. Yeah, I see the way you organize every day and I honestly admire you because I came up here from a really population dense area and I just see you being out here being all creative and just organizing in such a flat space and I'm like, whoa, yeah. literally superpowers. <laughs> <laughs> Tricky. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap up and I'm going to ask the last question. Um, and I feel like this would be a good kicker. Um, where do you see spoke folks in Creative Norway, um, in Norway Youth Climate Action, um, organizing in five years? This is a really good one. Um, spoke folks in five years. My dream for that is that there are little bike co-ops all over Maine, hauling trash and recycling and compost and educating the community about why it's so important to do those things and showing people that transportation on bikes um, can be really helpful and it is possible. Um, obviously in some really, really rural areas, that's not necessarily as accessible, but I would just love to see little spoke folks hubs all over the place. Um, Creative Norway, I would love to be collaborating more having more collaboration between artists and climate because like the main point of my talk was that I think it's so important and it grabs people's attention and it gets to the core of your emotion and I'd really love to see more climate work in my creative Norway space um yeah and and seeing more marginalized artists uplifted and in that space as well and then youth climate organizing in five years, I'm gonna be 30, which is insane to think about. And I'm gonna have a 10 year old at that point, which is also insane to think about. Um, but I would love to be able to have more young people in my position here in Western Maine so that it really starts to like spread across the map here. Um, because it is so rural, I think, we just need people who are here and dedicated and, and young and have energy. And I wanna be able to teach some of the young people around me how to do this work so that they can keep sending it out in ripples and waves. Um, so yeah, five years from now, I'd love to have like a huge team of young people and for it to keep going and not just end when the seniors graduate and move. And I want people to want to live in our area. Um, we're actually working on potentially having a Norway climate council here in our town and having young people involved in that and having that um, offered as a paid position for young people is also one of my like ultimate dreams for the next five years. Yeah, that is so important. So important. I just love the work that you're doing. Like I said, it just motivates me and all of these creative ways to organize. Wow, you are a stellar organizer. Just <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm like, talking to you is like, I've learned so much from you and the, the young people in MYCJ. I can't believe the work that you've been able to accomplish. I appreciate that, I appreciate that. 
So we're just gonna wrap up here. I do appreciate everyone coming today. Um, and Jess, it was so amazing to hear you talk. I cannot reiterate that enough. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, for folks looking to come to attend our next talk, we do not have our next speaker set yet, but we will pretty soon. So if you could just keep checking the Future Focus page for more info, which will be dropped right in the chat and have an amazing night. Thank you guys. Thanks.